Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to our study in James. Uh, today we're going to continue in chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 13 and go all the way to verse 18 today. Uh, but before we get into to the Word, let's, uh, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, I, I specifically come before you and ask that you bless this time um, that we spend together with you, Lord. Um, as those who view this video and have your word in front of them, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, show them truth. Show them the truth of who Jesus is and how love was displayed and is continuously displayed in him. And God, as we get into these texts today, I pray that you make it clear to us um, why you're not responsible for tempting temptations. Um, as we study these verses, it's very clear, Lord, that um, the blame rests on us. And Lord, I pray that you show the truth of that to those that are watching this video um, and that you may, may be glorified as a result. Uh, Lord Jesus, we love you. And we ask you again to bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the author of this letter we've talked about is James, right? James is the half-brother of Jesus. Jesus, in fact, did have half-brothers and sisters. Now, we also know that James, the author, um, eventually became the senior pastor in the church in Jerusalem. And he wrote this letter to a group of Christ-following, uh, professing Christians. Uh, people, men and women, who profess to be uh, Christians. Uh, all of them um, used to be Jewish and, would, and were professing to have been converted to Christianity. Um, some of them, we know, authentic, because uh, James refers to these, th those individuals as brothers. But then we also see in chapters 4 and 5 that um, the, some of them that he was writing to were in fact not converted. They were professing to be Christ followers, but it was evident that they were not born again. And so what James is doing in this letter um, is providing them with a practical manual for Christian living. And then, he, and that's the first purpose, and the second purpose was to challenge them to examine their faith in Christ, to determine its authenticity. Now, one of the things that we, we, we've discussed up until this point is that these individuals that James is writing to were fleeing persecution. I mean, up until this point in this letter, we talked about the testing of their faith. Uh, how God uses trials to produce steadfastness in us and how he provided us in, 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 in these verses that we just studied, uh, verses uh, 2 through 12, ways to persevere through trials. Because these individuals that James was writing to were being murdered for their professed faith in Christ. So they were experiencing trials. And now what James is going to do in these verses today is the Holy Spirit through James is going to show us why God cannot be and is not responsible for our temptations. But before we go into these, let's go ahead and read the verses. We're in chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 13 and go all the way to verse 18. So the Holy Spirit, through James, writes, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Ever since the first sin, right, was first sin, where Eve took of the fruit and then gave to her husband to eat. And both Adam and Eve ate the fruit which God commanded them not to eat. First sin, right? Ever since the first sin, man has had a desire, a tendency to pass blame off of himself or herself onto 
other things. And we see that very clearly in the first sin, right? Because when God confronted Adam on whether or not he ate of the fruit of the tree that God commanded him not to eat, what did Adam say? Right? Adam says to God, God says, Adam, did you eat of the fruit that I commanded you not to eat, right? And Adam says, it was the woman that you gave me. Right? Adam placing the blame on the woman, Eve, and on God himself. So Adam's saying, out of the three of us, I'm innocent. It was the woman that you gave me. And Eve did the same thing. Eve says it was the serpent, right? Placing blame on others, justifying our sin, placing blame on others. It's very clear, and we've all done it. I know I have. Excusing excuses to justify my sin. And what God is saying here is, is the Holy Spirit through James, God saying through, through James here in his word, there's no patience for blame shifting, for placing blame, especially on God. Because we see in verse 13, the first part of verse 13, where it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God doesn't tempt. And so what we're going to see in these verses is the Holy Spirit through James giving us four reasons, four explanations as to why God is not responsible for our temptations. It's not on God. It's on us. And we're going to see how and why it's not God's fault. And so to do that, God through James, right? Holy Spirit through James writing this letter shows us that God's not responsible for our temptations because of the nature of God, which we're going to see in verses 13, and we're going to jump to verse 17, because of the nature of man, wicked, sinful, deceitful heart, right? In verse 14, then in verse 15 and 16, he's going to show us that because of the nature of lust, that God's not responsible for our temptations because of the nature of what lust is. And then he's going to finish in verse 18 showing us how God's not responsible for our temptations because of the nature of regeneration, of, of being born again, of new birth. God giving us that life, right? That new, that new life, spiritual life in heaven forever when we trust in Christ and Christ alone. So let's go ahead and get into it. Let's start in verse 13. Uh, we're going to look at verse 13 and verse 17 to take a look at the first explanation as to why God is not responsible for temptation. It's because of the nature of God. Let's look at verse 13 and 17 to see the nature of God. What is it about the nature of God that shows us that he's not responsible for our temptation? 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. The actual opposite of temptation, right? Because that's what he's saying. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now, there's a difference between temptation and testing. We talked about this in some of our previous studies here. The difference between temptation and testing. Testing is used to determine and then show to prove the authenticity of a specific object, right? The, the motivation behind testing is positive. There's a positive motivation. The heart behind testing is positive because it's showing the authenticity of a specific object, in this case, uh, an individual, a born-again believer, their salvation. Now, tempting has a completely different motive. The heart behind tempting is evil, it's malicious. The desire behind it is trip somebody up. It's evil motive behind it. It's a negative heart behind what tempting is. Because tempting is intentionally putting things in place so that somebody may, 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 may fall or, or may make wrong choices or, or may, may be hurt. Again, that's the complete opposite of testing. Testing is to show that and, and, and show the authenticity with a heart that is motivated by, by love and, 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 and showing how the test will determine and show authenticity. Tempting is from a heart that's motivated by evil where the hope is to, that, 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 that um, it's, uh, the individual is being tripped up. So there's a completely difference here. And so because we know that God is of that, that, that positive, that loving motivation, and that's testing. 
to show, to determine the authenticity of the object, and in this case, the believer, a child. Because God's own nature, nature is incompatible with the nature of sin. It's like oil and water, it doesn't mix. I heard this one um, analogy. God is aware of evil, but is untouched by it. Okay? Like a sun, like sunlight, sunbeam shining down on a trash dump, right? The sunlight is untouched by the trash. God is untouched by evil, the trash of evil. He's holy, he's righteous, he's loving. He's eternally unmixed with evil. The trash has no impact on the sunbeam. Amen? Evil has no impact on God. It is not God's nature. And that's what we see here. Because he says, the Holy Spirit through James is showing us, God cannot be tempted with evil. And here we go. And he himself tempts no one. Period. End of story. He's against his nature because his nature is in loving, righteous, holy, and the nature of tempting was evil, malicious, right? So he doesn't tempt, God doesn't tempt anyone. God allows trials in which temptation can occur for a purpose. He doesn't do the tempting, but he allows trials for us to go through trials, not to solicit believers to sin, but to move them along to greater endurance in this sanctification process. And he does it with a loving, tender, caring heart towards his children. <clears throat> Notice I said his children, those of us who have trusted in him and him alone for his work on the cross. And so we see also in verse 17, God is referred to as the father of lights. Now that Father of Lights was an ancient Jewish title for God, referring to him as creator, as the great giver of light in the form of the sun, the moon, and the stars. And those sources of light, um, is, is how were they got the name, where he was referred to as the Father of Light. So we see that. So notice also that James is writing to a bunch of individuals who were Jewish, who have professed to be converted to Christianity, some of which the Holy Spirit did convert and authentic, some of which were not. And we see that truth in verses in, in chapter 4 and 5. And so he, he refers to God the Father by a title that his Jewish readers, or one-time Jewish readers, would understand and, and, under, and get. It's beautiful. So now let's look at verse 14, because in verse 14 we're going to see um, how and why God is not responsible for our temptations because of the nature of man. Because in essence, the blame for our temptation and our sin is on us. So let's look at verse 14. He says, But each person who is tempted, but each person, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Let's read it again, verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We have to recognize it's a, that every human being is tempted by his own desire. Nobody is different. Every human being does this. Nobody's better than anybody else. The um, Bible's very clear. For all have sinned and fallen short. Didn't say, for all have sinned and s except for Mother Teresa. No. For all have sinned. Even the holiest, righteous person that you think you know also fallen short of the glory of God and have sinned. And this, 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 this truth applies to them as well. That, that each person is tempted, every person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own des desire by his own desire. Not God, not Adam saying, it was a woman that you gave me. Not, Adam saying essentially, I was enticed, I was in Lord by Eve and by you. That's what Adam's saying, but that's not the truth. He's missed it. It's us. And so Lord and enticed are different aspects of the temptation process. Lord, the word Lord, look at the word Lord. Translated from the Greek word excelco. 
Okay? Again, we're looking at the word Lord, translated from the Greek word excelco. And it has the meaning of dragging away as if compelled by an inner desire. It was often used, this Greek word, because we know New Testament was written in Greek, right? This Greek word was often used as a hunting term to refer to a baited trap, which was designed to lure unsus unsuspecting animals into it. So lured, right? And it's that I, the, the, the idea, the meaning of being dragged away as if compelled by an inner desire. Being lured like a, like, a, like a fish being lured to a worm on the hook has that inner desire for that worm and he goes after it because it drags him into it. He, he, it's, it lures the, the fish into it. It's the same way with us. <clears throat> the next word, enticed, right? Because we're looking at lured and enticed. Enticed was translated from the Greek word del leazo, del leazo, del leazo. Another word which, has, which was commonly used as a fishing term, like we've talked about with the, the excelco, the Greek word for lure. But the purpose was also to lure the prey from safety to capture and, to, and, and, and eventually to death, right? So lured, it has that meaning of, of compelled to an inner, an inner, there's an inner desire, there's a di desire within me that compels me to, to, to this object outside of me, this desire within me, I'm lured and it speaks to that desire within me. So then the, the word enticed, is again, it, it was referred to as a fishing term specifically to the bait whose purpose was to lure the prey from safety to capture and then eventually to death, which we'll talk about here in a minute, the idea of that death eventually coming. So animals and fish are successfully lured to traps and hooks because the bait is too attractive for them to resist. Think about it, a fish on a hook, and a worm, a fish looking at a worm. It looks good, it smells good, they desire for the baits, it's the desire is so intense that it causes them to lose caution and to overlook or ignore any danger. That, that describes our sinful nature, our being tempted with ourselves. And, and that, that's that specific thing that, that, is, that is not of God, that sinful desire that we have. Not God's fault, our fault. So we succumb to temptation in the exact same way when our own lust draws us towards those evil things that are appealing to our fleshy desire. Satan tries to make the sin as attractive as possible, but the truth is it wouldn't be attractive to us if our own sinful desire wasn't present, right? Satan knows that our sinful uh, um, fleshy desire within us he knows that desire and puts those lures in front of us, those, those, things, those bait in front of us, because he knows that our in, sinful, fleshy, sinful desire longs after that. We are directly lured and enticed by our own lust, period. The fault is entirely with us. And we must agree with God on this truth. That we can't be like Adam and placing the blame on even God, or like Eve placing the blame on the serpent, Satan. But we must take responsibility for the truth that I'm responsible for my own sin and the sinful desire that lies within. And we go to God and ask Him to forgive us and to, to help us turn from these things. And the only way that's possible is by turning to the Lord Jesus and seeing the truth of how love was manifested um, in Jesus and on that cross. So the, the other thing that I want to talk about is and think about how this, this analogy with bait on a hook uh, applies to our sinful nature, to the nature of man, man's sinful nature, right? Because the bait changes. The bait isn't always the same depending on the individual that we're talking about. Just like um, a, a, a fish. If you're, if you're fishing for a specific kind of fish, you throw a, a bait on a hook that they desire where that same bait might not be desired by, by another fish, so the bait is changed to something that the other fish would desire, right? And so the same could be said for us, where, where the, the, a workaholic's lustful, sinful desire is work. 
right? Power and, and pride and, and getting accolades, that workaholic, right? So Satan, um, we know then that, 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 that the, the sinful desire within lusts after that work, right? Or if you take um, work off the bait and you put in heroin, let's put on heroin as the bait. Now that, that heroin addict lusts after the her heroin where the bait of work wouldn't work for him. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be efficient. It wouldn't, it wouldn't cause that. It wouldn't draw that desire towards it. And so, but we have got to recognize the truth that we are responsible. It's our own sinful desire. That's what we're seeing in this verse. That God is not responsible. Uh, for, right here. Explanations of why God is not responsible for our temptations because of the sinful nature of man. Let's look at the next one. The sinful nature or the nature of lust. 15 and 16. Holy Spirit through James writes, Then desire... Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. So we see then the explanation why God is not responsible for our temptation is the nature of lust. First two words, then desire when it has conceived, right? Desire, lust. Shifting from the hunting and fishing metaphors, the Holy Spirit through James now uses the metaphor of childbirth to illustrate the point of that lust and the desire and what, what's created from that. So there's a process here that, that we see when in, in, in regards to um, the, the, the process where we see sin giving birth, right? Let's look at it. We see, let's read this verse again. Verse 15 and 16. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. So the first step in this process is desire. Step one is desire. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at Genesis 2 and 3 and see how this same truth, this same process, is clearly evident in the first sin in the garden. So the first step is desire. Itself, desire, isn't morally wrong. It isn't sinful. Desiring isn't sinful. What makes it sinful is what we desire. Because I desire to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring Him glory. Now, if I desire things of the world, Satan's evil spiritual system, that becomes sinful. So desire in itself isn't morally wrong or sinful. But it does start as an emotion or a longing for something we see or hear about. And we want to have it or to do it. So the first step is the desire. The second step is deception. In the process is deception. But now we're getting into it. Now we're getting into the sinful um, behaviors and choices that oppose uh, the almighty loving creator of the universe, where we see deception. Deception is more closely related to the mind than to the emotion. Because once now what, what happens in deception is we begin to rationalize, to justify the thing that we desire. Okay? And if it's not of God, we're, now we're getting into the sinful, the sinful um, opposing God mindset and process, right? Because that's what we're talking about. Like the animal or the fish that goes after the bait, the desire to simply have what we want is so strong that we are inclined to discount the possible dangers. We deceive ourselves, right? We deceive ourselves as to the possible dangers and pitfalls and problems that we will experiencing by but we will that we will experience by engaging in the specific sin of the object that, that that sinful object that we lust after, okay? That we that we desire. It's at this point when we begin to deceive, to justify, to rationalize, having that specific desire, engaging in that specific desire, it's at that point that desire and lust has con desire and lust has conceived and given life to sin, and now we see sin begin to form and grow at that moment of deception, where we deceive ourselves. Um, as to the possible dangers, the right, the wrong, of what we're lusting after, desiring after. So then the third part, the third step in this process is disobedience. 
So the third step in the process is disobedience. Now this, step's invo this step involves our will. Something that we've longed for, desired, something that we've justified, we've deceived ourselves and, and justified, rationalized having it. Now we're going to engage in being disobedient to God and going after it. When you can throw anything into this process and it makes sense, workaholic or, or pornography, alcoholic or uh, drugs or um, anger or whatever it may be, you can throw it into this process and see very clearly that the first step is desire, I desire after it. And then I, de I deceive myself as to the possible danger, so I go after it in disobedience by engaging in it. Now it's a matter of choice. I've chosen to disobey. I've chosen to engage in that. And now the, the disobedience eventually will lead to the fourth and final step, which is death. So I'm physical, and then uh, the other sp spiritual, death. It may take <coughs> years for the sin to mature, but the overall end will be death. For those who reject the cross and reject God's gift in salvation and forgiveness for all the times we've, off, we've, we've engaged in this process. So what I want to do is turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 first. And we're going to see these four steps clearly present in the first sin recorded. And we'll walk through it. So Genesis chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 5 and 6 first. Okay, because what we're looking at is step 1, desire. What we're looking for is how this sin originated and, 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 and is rooted in initially the first step, which is desire. Genesis 3, verse 5 through 6. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, here it is, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Which you do, she eventually ate, right? But here's where it starts. There's that desire, right? We see in, 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 the, in, in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, right? So let's look at the next step. Now we're getting into deception. We know that Satan is the author of, uh, of deception. He's the master deceiver, and he seeks to deceive us. The bait that he used with Eve was to get her to question God. And, her all, and, and then that sinful desire within man that we have, um, she was more than willing to go ahead with that, to question God. So now let's look at it. We're going to go back to uh, chapter 2 of Genesis. Because Eve discounted the possible dangers and ignored the Lord's warning, warning in Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. Let's read it. And the, Lord God, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God made it very clear that when you, if you choose to eat of this tree, you're going to die. You will surely die. Satan, the deceptor, the, the deceiver, is recorded in chapter 3, verse 4, saying, But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. That's a lie. God said you would. Satan's throwing that lie out, and Eve and Adam believed it. And they deceived themselves to the, 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 the very clear consequences of choosing to disobey God, which they then did. We see the third step is their disobedience. Both of them took of the fruit and ate. And then what happened? Both of them um, immediately were spiritually dead and eventually would experience physical death, separation from God spiritually, and then they would physically die. So we see the, the same process um, in the first sin as we t as, as that that the Holy Spirit through James mentions here in verses 15 and 16, um, saying that the nature of lust, God is not responsible for our temptations because of the nature of lust. Now let's move to verse 18. Verse 18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature, creatures. So the fourth explanation as to why God is not responsible for our temptations is because of the nature of regeneration, the giving of new life, of spiritual life. 
He's not responsible for our temptation because God does the very opposite. He gives us spiritual life. For those of us, a new nature, a divine nature, for those of us who have trusted in Christ and Christ alone and recognized and have agreed with God on our sin, that it is my fault, my responsibility. And when we recognize that and believe that, we see the gift and the grace of the cross of God extending us forgiveness for that. And He gets the glory because He's rescued us from that. And so in verse 18, there are three questions about regeneration, about new birth. That, that the Holy Spirit through James answers. So let's look at it. I want to break this verse down and look at it from three different lenses because we see some truths in, these ver in this verse about regeneration, about being born again, about new spiritual life, about that new divine uh, nature that God gives us when, when, when the Holy Spirit converts us. Verse 18, again, the first question that the Holy Spirit through James answers about regeneration is who does it? Who does the regenerating? Is it me? Is it, is it the pastor that regenerates me? Is it God himself that regenerates me? Let's look at it. Verse 18. First four words. Of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth. It's by his own will. It's God. So the question is, who does it? The answer is God. God is the one who is responsible for regeneration. And it's His action. He's the one who does it. We can't save ourselves. God's sovereign and responsible for giving spiritual life. We can't earn it. It's a gift of, a gift of God. It's by his, his sovereign will and God washing our sins away and pouring out His wrath on His Son Jesus on the cross for the sins that I've committed and opposed Him. And he grants forgiveness. The second question that God answers about regeneration in this verse is how does it happen? So who does it? We know God does it. How does it happen? How does regeneration happen? Look at this verse. He brought us forth. How? How did he bring us forth? How were we converted? How, was, how did regeneration occur? How did new life occur? New birth occur? Being born again? He brought us forth. How? By the word of truth. He does it through the Holy Spirit revealing to the believer the truth of God's Word. That's how it happens. And when this happens, the person trusts alone in the finished work of God, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And God then credits him, and him or her with forgiveness, full righteousness of His Son. So now we know that the second question, how does it happen? We know the first question, that God does it. How He does it is by He brought us forth by the word of truth. And then the third question that we see answered in these verses is, why is it done? Let's look at the end of it. That we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. The primary purpose of regeneration and salvation is not to benefit man. The primary purpose of regeneration, of salvation, of giving some, uh, a, a sinner new life in Christ, being born again, is his primary purpose is to fulfill God's sovereign purpose. And that is to lift him up, to glorify his holy name, because he alone is worthy. So that's why it's done. It's not for man's primary benefit. The primary purpose is to fulfill God's sovereign plan, which is to bring glory to his name, because he is only, he's the only one worthy. He's awesome. So he talks about being a first fruits. First fruits were the first and best of the crops that were harvested, which we um, were to give to the Lord um, in, in, our, in, in the tithing. The, the, the Jews were to give of their first fruits, the first set of crops, because it's usually the healthiest and usually is, was an indicator as to the rest of what, what the rest of the crops would look like. So we see in this verse... Um, we see the fourth explanation of why God is not responsible for our temptation, which is because of the nature of regeneration. That God himself actually gives us spiritual life. It's, he gives it to us. How does he give it to us? By bringing us forth by the word of truth. And why does he give it to us? To, provide, to, to fulfill his sovereign purposes. So in these verses, the Holy Spirit through James, remember, writing to these, this group of Christ-professing followers, some of which were authentic, some of which were not, Right, right to this group, and in this he puts forth 
for explanation of why God is not responsible for our temptations. So in verse 13 and 17, we saw that the first explanation is because of God's nature. He's righteous. He's holy. He's perfect. Tempting is of the evil, malicious intent, which we're responsible for because we see in verse 14, the second explanation is because of the nature of man. It's sinful, wicked, deceitful heart that we are responsible. It's our own desires that are responsible for our temptation. Verse 15 and 16, then we see how the Holy Spirit through James shows that it's the nature of lust as to why God's not responsible. It's the nature itself, and he puts forth, we see that process of, of sin, that, 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 that sin that leads to death, um, which is the desire, right? There's, there's an inward desire for the thing that, that, that we long for that, in, that sinful object or that sinful thing. Uh, there's a desire, then there's deception where we manipulate and deceive ourselves as to the possible dangers, and then there's disobedience as we engage in, in that. We choose to disobey God and engage in that sin, and we know that that leads to death, just like we saw in Genesis 2 and 3. And then in verse 18, we see the last reason, explanation as to why God is not responsible for our temptation, because of the nature of regeneration. God gives us spiritual life, the complete opposite of what this temptation uh, occurs, what happens in temptation. It's the complete opposite. God gives us a, 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 a spiritual life, regeneration. He gives us regeneration. We're regenerated by His power of His own will, by the word of truth. He brings us forth by the word of truth, by the preaching and teaching of God's word. And then why? So that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures because uh, we are to fulfill his sovereign purposes. The loving creator of the universe to be the, the first fruits of his creatures. So let's finish by reading these verses one last time um, and then we'll pray. The Holy Spirit, through James, writes in chapter 1, verse 13 through 18, Let no one say when he... Is tempted I am being tempted by God for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one but each person is tempted when he is Lord and enticed by his own desire whose desire his own desire then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that we have an opportunity to study your word, to see the truth in uh, well, first of all, with the difference between testing and temptation. Lord Jesus, we pray that you are glorified um, as we continue to, to study your word and you sanctify us and that we see the truth that you are not responsible for any temptation. You cannot be tempted and you tempt no one. And that we are tempted from our own sinful desires. Protect us, Lord Jesus, from ourselves. Get us to a point, Lord, that we recognize the truth, that we our sin opposes you, and that you lovingly offered yourself up so that we may that you may receive the the wrath of your father so that we may receive forgiveness and god help us to continue to uh, submit to you and trust you even more all for your glory and we ask this in jesus mighty name amen